Hello, and welcome to our Week 2 Supplemental Lecture on Jürgen Habermas's Modernity, an Unfinished Project. Uh, this piece is in some ways uh, a sort of response to the kind of things that were written in another one of our supplementals this week, um, Foucault's What is Enlightenment? So if you'd like, you may want to watch that podcast if you haven't read the Foucault piece before watching this one, because um, you can see a little bit more about what Habermas is doing if you do that. This piece also addresses some of the issues uh, that were raised in Latour, so you might want to take a look at that podcast as well. So Habermas is a major political and social theorist, and we'll run into him several times during the course. Um, here he's concerned with the issue of postmodernism, which is something that we'll look into in a few weeks. But what we want to focus on in looking at this piece today is actually how he conceptualizes the modern that he's using to play off against postmodernism. So he starts by talking about our modernity. There's something distinctive about our modernity. Uh, he asks whether postmodernism is needed because we've now moved beyond the modern, or whether postmodernism can be seen as a kind of reactionary anti-modernism. And he says, to get to the bottom of this, we need to understand something about how our modernity is different from other periods that also called themselves modern. It's not unusual for there to be a historical shift and a time to arise and people will be aware that there is a change and that they are different from what came before and they'll refer to themselves as modern. But Habermas says usually when this happens what they're doing is secretly making a connection back to what's understood as a classical era. So there would have been a classical era and some period of decline when the connection to that era got lost and then there's the modern that reconnects to that. For Habermas this is not characteristic of our modernity. Our modernity, he says, dating to the mid-19th century is unusual. It breaks the spell of the classical. And it does this in part because there is an ideal of the infinite progress of human knowledge and infinite social and moral progress. And because of that infinite progress, our modern is not going to point back to some early historical period. It's going to be forward-looking, forward-directed, more restless. It is associated, our modern, with a romantic conception of the Middle Ages. And he says this produced a radicalized consciousness of modernity that detached itself from all previous historical connection and understood itself solely in abstract opposition to tradition and history as a whole. Okay, so there's this opposition between the romantic conception of the past and our modern, which understands itself to be fundamentally different, but there's not a connection between our modern and some apparently classical period that we're trying to point out to point ourselves to. And Habermas says that this is reflected in the fact that modern art relies solely on present relevance. Solely on present relevance, but he distinguishes it from fashion. Fashion is the restless movement from one thing to the next because you're bored, and let's see what's fashionable this week, and let's see what's fashionable next week. And there's no difference between these different weeks, these different moments in fashion. That's not true for modernity, for Habermas. Modernity, he says, generates its own internal classical tradition. Modern art has ways of talking about classical modernism, and Habermas says this does actually make sense. It's not a strange thing to say. It develops its own internal standards of assessment and evaluation, and they don't point back to the past. They are fully modern, but they're ways of talking about things being more classically modern than others. So it carries its standards of judgment inside itself and develops them within itself. And then he talks about avant-garde art. Avant-garde art reflects a sh transformed consciousness of time. And Habermas talks about the spatial metaphors of time used, that you're moving into the future, as so you're physically moving, you're conquering new territory in the future. And the future doesn't have any end point. It is indefinite and contingent. There's always going to be more future. You don't know what it's going to hold. It is a, an unknown. Avant-garde art glorifies the present, and it's associated with what Habermas calls new and subjectively defined pasts. So there's an interesting connection there with the Latour, if you watch that lecture. It is a restless, self-critical movement, but it expresses a yearning for a lasting, immaculate present. doesn't necessarily think you can have that present, but there is a yearning for it. So it's not nihilistic, its criticism is in service of a particular desire 
It is ahistorical. It wants to explode the continuum of history. It attacks tradition as the source of constrictive norms. Okay, so Habermas outlines all of this, and then he says, this really doesn't resonate much with people today. Okay, it used to be a resonant thing. It used to be something that drew people to it. Not really anymore. So what does this mean? Does it mean the modern is ending? He doesn't think so, but he does think that something's gone drastically wrong. And here he starts talking about neoconservatism, and he, he picks on a guy named Daniel Bell, and we'll meet Bell a little later in the term. Uh, Daniel Bell doesn't consider himself a neoconservative, but Habermas is by no means the only person who applies this label to Bell. A little bit later in the term, though, we will talk about neoconservatism, about people who will call themselves neoconservative, so they're not like Bell, they're happy with the term, and other critics of neoconservatives. It's conceived in different ways. So this is Habermas's way of accusing someone of being a neoconservative who doesn't think he is one. And Habermas says that neoconservatism displaces the blame for unwelcome consequences of capitalism onto cultural modernity. Okay, and what Habermas has in mind is something that you can actually see in the newspaper today. It's not a rare occurrence. You get things where people are complaining about you know, the young and their bad attitudes toward work or about consumer habits. All people are doing is being hedonistic and they just buy the next iPad or the next iGadget and... Uh, they move on, uh, or they give too much emphasis to leisure time. So Habermas is pointing out things like this, something he might also have pointed out that is characteristic of the same sort of move is the way in which movements that are called identity politics movements, movements like feminism and civil rights movements and post-colonial movements, get attacked as though they have caused huge sweeping social and economic changes where it's entirely unclear what role the movements played in causing those changes. So with reference to feminism, for example, there will be a discourse that spills over at times into the popular press as though feminism has destroyed the moral fabric of the family, as though it's been something very, very corrosive. And Habermas is suggesting that what attacks like that do is they deflect attention from huge social and economic restructurings that are going on in the background. So whether feminism had happened or not, we've had a massive economic restructure that has meant that every adult member of the household has been drawn into paid work. Okay? Feminism is a movement that happens while that is going on, but it's entirely unclear that feminism is what caused that restructuration of the economy. And so Habermas thinks that the cultural critics who are laying into various movements or various cultural trends are blaming those trends disproportionately for social and economic changes, and therefore deflecting criticism from social and economic causes. He talks about neo-populist protests, so people who are rabble-rousing, who are drumming up the crowds and channeling their anger. And he says, where's the anger coming from? Neo-populist protests, he says, are merely giving forceful expression to widespread fears concerning the possible destruction of the urban and natural environments and the destruction of humane forms of social life. Okay, so these protests are picking up on a real fear that is present, but they're channeling that fear in ways that, according to Habermas, are actually not going to let you do anything productive about the causes of the fear, and in fact are hurting our only possible source of resources that could actually solve some of these problems. So the cause for Habermas is what he calls a one-sided process of modernization. It's a very interesting term, and it's quite central to Habermas's work as a whole. He has a vision in his larger works of a potential form of modernity, a potential kind of modernization that could have gone a very, very different way from the way that it actually went. You could have had a broad and critical release of intellectual and moral and legal and economic and cultural resources that could have led to very emancipatory outcomes, but you don't get that because what you get instead is the rise of capitalism. And for Habermas, the rise of capitalism is associated with the rise of a bureaucratic administrative state, a technocratic state that grabs the insights and the resources of science and uses it to dominate its populations. And this distorts modernization. It makes it into something that it needn't have been. And Habermas thinks the neoconservative critiques, by fixating on the cultural dimension, distort our vision of this. They distract us from what's going on.
And then he talks about a project of modernity. He says, you can see an attitude of modernity in art, but not a project. And this is interesting to compare with the Foucault piece from this week, if you have a time to look at both, because Foucault is quite focused on the attitude of modernity. And here Habermas provides a little outline of his bigger argument. So modern societies, he says, are characterized by differentiation. And again, you can take a look at the Latour reading from this week to see someone who doesn't like this way of characterizing modernity and its difference from non-modern. But for Habermas, there's a differentiation of modern societies, and this differentiation separates out things that were blended together in non-modern forms of social life. And it separates out science, morality and law, and then artistic production, which for Habermas is associated with critical practice. What ought to have happened, or what could have happened in an ideal rolling out of modernity, is that each of these spheres could have been institutionalized into its own realm, where it would have developed its own internal logic. They generate quite different kinds of insights, science, law, and art, for Habermas. And what should have happened is that differentiation, which has given us such huge progress in science and technology, you should have seen equivalent progress in law, in the development of humane social institutions, and in art and criticism. All of these spheres should have shown the same progress that we currently associate with science. That's not what happened. What happened instead is a one-sided release of the possibilities of science, distorted into the development of technologies that were applied in capitalism. And what you see in each sphere as a result of that distortion is a growing gap between expert and general public cultures. And to get a sense of what Habermas has in mind here, think of something like the global warming debate today, where you have an expert scientific culture that is somewhat insular, that is somewhat difficult for many people in the general public to understand. When experts in that culture try to intervene, they're then hitting pushbacks from general culture, which has not assimilated the insights of science. And we're at the moment at a sort of a a flashpoint of debates over the role of that expert culture, whether it is legitimate, whether it can be disregarded, uh, whether it is an inappropriate seizure of authority by experts. So Habermas has fights like that in mind. He says the Enlightenment era was very optimistic that you could develop these specialized insights in these realms of science and law and art, and then you could feed them back into general culture, and the general public would participate in this progress. It would assimilate and incorporate in the insights from all of these spheres. From where we're standing today, Habermas says, things look much more pessimistic. Okay, And the global warming debate is one of the things that he has in mind. It looks very difficult, the issue of how you get the insights from these expert cultures into general culture such that the experts are kept in check and they're refreshed by the values of the general culture and the general culture understands what's going on in the expert spheres and can contribute to it meaningfully. And then he talks about Kant and the autonomy of the aesthetic. Okay, so the idea that the sphere of art and the sphere of criticism actually has its own rightful place as a separate sphere like the scientific or the legal Habermas says, aesthetic objects are not, for Kant, objects of scientific knowledge or legislative action. They're a different kind of thing, but they can nevertheless be subject to objective judgment. Now, this is a strange concept. We tend to think of art as something that's sort of a matter of personal taste. But Habermas is suggesting that just as there are kinds of universality that are characteristic of scientific judgments, there's a way that we can argue with one another about the truth value of claims, and there are kinds of general judgment that we can apply in legislative action, we can debate about the, the goodness of our laws, the justice involved in our laws, there is something similar that is available to us with reference to art and criticism. The fact that we have difficulty seeing that for Habermas is a sign of how poorly modernization has played out, how much the aesthetic sphere has been trampled um, by the other spheres. Kant is interested specifically in disinterested pleasure. 
in contemplating and enjoying art that has no practical purpose at all. This is historically actually quite unusual. Things that we think of as artistic works would have often had some sort of practical function in other societies. They would have been part of everyday practice or some kind of specialized ritual practice, but they would not have been things that people just looked at or contemplated in order to criticize them or evaluate them or experience them in some way. This is distinctively modern. And Habermas says it relies on a combination of different social changes. Uh, one of them is a market arising for art. And that may seem weird that you know the disinterested contemplation of art relies on the market, but one of the things that it does is it removes art from the specifically ritual or sacred sphere in which a lot of it had been produced. It makes it something that can circulate. And with that, you get a, a the rise of art criticism as a practice. And art criticism is something for Habermas that can communicate the possibility of a non-purposive enjoyment of art that it is possible to assess and to interact and interpret art even if you're not interpreting it by saying how is this painting possibly useful. Okay, So there's a, a set of criteria that are specific to the aesthetic realm, that are proper to it, that don't have to do with whether something's serving a practical use. And Habermas thinks this is a good thing. It is a good insight to keep hold of. And he talks about the fact that artists and art critics understand their own interpretations as actually part and parcel of artistic production. So it's not just that you make a thing and that thing is art, it is the whole process of interpreting, criticizing, reflecting on that is part of the process of artistic production. So there's a move away for Habermas from art as a representation of something else, which implies that art has to serve a function with reference to something else, it has to be practical in some particular sense, uh, to the development of a set of values for judging art on its own terms. And for Habermas, this is something that had the same potential as the development of a sphere of science or development of a sphere of moral and legal reflection, the possibility to make genuine progress in this area. That progress doesn't completely realize itself. And Habermas talks about, and this is a concept that he's borrowing from Adorno, who's another figure in the Frankfurt School, this tradition that Habermas is part of. We'll see Adorno again later in the term. But Habermas says, art promises happiness through the relation to the whole. Okay, so we've got a, a society that it is possible to have emancipatory dreams about, and art suggests the feeling of wholeness, of harmony, of integration that might be possible. But this is a reconciliation that cannot take place. We exist in a broken society. We exist in a society that is standing in the way of particular emancipatory hopes. And art allows people to have a confrontation with that experience of the broken society. It holds out the possibility for something more, for something that transcends what exists, but it reveals by that very fact the non-realization of these emancipatory dreams. There's a problem in art and its ability to serve its critical function that is also manifest in the spheres of science and law. It's just less visible. All of these spheres suffer from the separation of expert cultures from everyday cultures. And Habermas also talks about a phenomenon he calls reification. Reification is when you take something that is living, that is fluid, that is in motion, and you treat it like a thing. You freeze it, you ossify it, you make it sort of stable and lifeless. There's a reification in these spheres. They are rigid. They are not fluid and creative and expressive of human freedom. And looking at this, looking at this process of reification, looking at the thwarting of critical impulses, looking at the domination of technology through the economy, looking at the domination of the bureaucratic state over everyday life, Habermas says some critics say well, this is the product of enlightenment. This is what enlightenment gave us. And what it gave us is a terroristic reason. Okay, And some of Habermas's predecessors in the Frankfurt School are pretty close to this argument. So he's reacting critically back on his own tradition. But Habermas says this is too pessimistic. Alternatives exist where the expert culture is appropriated from the perspective of the life world. We did not have to end up in a situation with experts that operate autonomously from the criticism of the everyday public and with the everyday public unable to even understand what's going on in the expert spheres. This was not inevitable 
But if we want to undo it, we have to come up with a new form of modernization, Habermas says, that can be developed in non-capitalist directions. Okay, we have to eliminate the domination of everyday life by the capitalist economy and the bureaucratic state. So having said that that's our alternative, he then comes to three conservatisms. Not all of these would conceive of themselves as conservatisms. And Habermas doesn't think we should do any of these three things. He wants the alternative form of modernization that he's proposing. The first form of conservatism he calls the young conservatives, and this is sort of his way of grouping together a grab bag of primarily French theorists uh, and saying these guys are not as critical as they think they are. He puts Foucault in this category. He puts Derrida in this category at this point. He may change his mind on Derrida later on. He puts Bataille in this category. The young conservatives, he said, want to break out of the modern world altogether. But they do this by trying to use a modernist attitude against modernism. So they don't want to break out of the modern world and go back to the past. What they're doing is looking at things that are outside modernity for new forms of spontaneity. So they don't believe, as Habermas does, that you can do something more critical, more emancipatory within modernity. They think you've got to burst outside its boundaries. So they're taking a modernist attitude, but they're not realizing we've still got some options within modernity itself. Then you've got the old conservatives. Habermas says they did not allow themselves to be contaminated by cultural modernity in the first place. These are the people who just don't want the modern world. They want to go back to a simpler, undifferentiated society prior to modern technology, prior to modern legal concepts, and certainly prior to modern art, uh, and live in a simpler world. And then there are the new conservatives, the neoconservatives. They're interesting because they welcome science and they'll even tolerate science going outside its sphere of kind of academic truth discussions, particularly if it's making contributions to the technology that is useful for capitalism. So they're pro-science conservatives. They are not wanting to go back to an earlier time. But what they don't want are for the explosive potentials of cultural modernity to get released. And so they pile on, they criticize these potentially explosive elements in our cultural production as though that's the enemy, and then they help to perpetuate the dominance of a particular kind of technocratic, authoritarian, bureaucratic state, and a particular kind of economy. Habermas thinks there are other choices. <laughs>